we're going to go through a few of the chapters of why is this happening to me again. Um, Michael Rice, who will join us shortly. So all these sessions will be recorded. The session is recorded and shared publicly to support others in these teachings. And I'm Yinka and I run Hear My Voice Book Club, which is an inspirational self-development books. All the events can be found on Meetup. What's on for the rest of the week? So we've got 5 a.m. club tomorrow. We've got the children's session at 7 p.m. We're doing children's meditation and drawing. Um, we've got Saturday and Sunday's Insanity. And the monthly book club is Money and Law of Attraction, which is on Thursday, the 1st of December. The schedule for next week looks pretty much the same as this week, apart from there might be a uh, change of the children's meditation time. As you all know, Hear My Voice Book Club runs non-profit events, so everyone can take part regardless of their financial status. Any donations to tonight's session or anything to do in relation to Michael Rice's teachings, if people can send donations to um, straight to his site on um, whyagain.org donations. And um, support Michael in sharing these teachings. I'm going to just start off with some shoulder rolls, just loosen up the body, you might want to release any tension from today, to so choose a comfortable sitting position, take a nice deep breath in as you draw up the shoulders, and as you exhale through the mouth, bring the shoulders down, nice deep breath in, and exhale. One more time, nice deep breath in. And exhale. Just as we wait for Michael, I'm just gonna take you straight into a breakout room into where you can introduce yourselves and where you're from and something you're appreciating. Michael's here. Oh, Michael's here <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> Welcome. Am I invisible? Yes, you were. Oh, you're at the top of my screen, that's why. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Let's go for the big breakout rooms. Okay, let's see. Um, so it'll only be a short few minutes because we have got quite a bit today. So it'll just be a couple of minutes just to share something you're appreciating.
you go to pause everyone back. So I'm going to click on start straight away. Um, let's see, Zoom square start. All right, we're going to just take a moment to breathe before I um, introduce Michael. Just holding your breath is exactly how you acquire a past about something and carry it with you. Holding your breath attaches the pain of any experience to a reality in the mind. If that reality is triggered, even through external circumstances, do not justify it. There will be pain. So remember to just breathe. So we're just going to hold a minute to just breathe. Breathing with you, young lady. You've got a lovely voice, Michael. I heard your voice, Gina, but I couldn't quite tell what you were saying. I said, you've got a lovely voice. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Projection. Oh, well, I'm projecting. Let's just breathe here. Try and yank in that. You want to just take a nice deep breath in. And then just let it go. So today we're going to be doing Why Is This Happening to Me Again with Michael Rice. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, Michael? Oh, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us your experience of this work. That's the best introduction I know. Oh, okay, so I don't even know how I found Michael Rice, but for me, it's the missile, missing pink piece. I see it like a jigsaw piece. I read a lot of books, practice a lot of different teachings, but it was definitely the missing piece of all the teachings that I teach and learn. Um, so that's what it's been for me. And as soon as I read the book, I knew I needed Michael. I need to, to message Michael just to say I was doing this book at the book club. Didn't expect him to ever to be, uh, join the session, but he did, and he, he stayed ever since, coming to teach at his teachings of why is this happening to me again. Um, and I am definitely somebody who's asked why is this happening to me again many, many times. So now I can start to break those patterns and understand why it's happening again. Well, when you first uh, told me, Yinka, that you were going to do this book study, I was thrilled. Actually, one of the, uh, in the early days of developing this work, there was a gentleman who came along and keyed into the work, and he uh, actually started to book me in different localities around the country. And one of the things that he used to say was to the, to the people he was promoting me to, this is back, you know, 30, 40 years ago was that if Michael Rice got a chance, he'd do a workshop at a phone booth. Yeah. <laughs> and that's true. You know, uh, you never know when you're talking to the person who's the critical mass person. You know, the physicist Yeshua 2,000 years ago said a little leavening leavens the whole loaf. And he was not talking about bread. He was talking about the work that it would take to support enough people who would literally incarnate the truth of being into their physiology, the energy of active present love. And that when we got to critical mass, you know, the leavening, mm -hmm. the critical mass is, you know, when we, we have a substance in the lab and you put a drop of another substance in and nothing happens, you put another drop, another drop, hundred drops later, nothing's changed. And then all of a sudden, 
one more drop and the whole primary substance shifts and changes its structure, its appearance, everything about it changes. And so my commitment is that we will take this to every mind, heart and being on the planet, but I don't expect that I'm going to, you know, stand in front of every vile and vicious mind on the planet and teach and convince them to utilize forgiveness. But my commitment is to make it available to enough people. So when you said, well, we're going to do this book club, well, of course, I'll come and do it because that's what our commitment is, is to make it available, to put it out there. And so I appreciate what you're doing. And, uh, you know, this is a, a, a part of the critical mass that we're about, uh, about working toward and developing on a literally on a global scale. So thank you for what you're doing so that we can um, play with and express and bring these tools to others who, as, uh, as part of developing that critical mass. So our, our next chapter, I, I, maybe we should just open the floor for, uh, you know, are there any questions on what we've covered previously? And, and when I say questions on what we've covered previously, I wanna limit that to what we talked about with the book and what our subject of, of study is. I know that everybody would love personal one-on-one -on -one support with their issue, but that's not our purpose here. We've, we've done that on occasion. We've done a worksheet with someone, but that's not our objective here. Our objective is to create a broad understanding of this process and these tools that come under the title of why is this happening to me again? So if anyone, again, not, your personal issue and how can we support you with that? You know, if you want the answer to that question, I'd suggest that you go back and start with our radio show archives, you know, for 11 years, five days a year, or pardon me, five days a week, 52 weeks a year, we've done at least one hour and oftentimes two hours of radio shows. And that's all in the archives. And whatever your question is, whatever your personal question is, how do I work through this? How do I relate? How do I fix this in with this relationship? Or how do I handle that? How do I take care of this? If you go back and listen to the archives, literally every word that I say, if you listen to the 11, the last 11 years of archives will be to answer your question. Every tool we've got, everything we teach is about working through those issues. But my objective in asking right now for questions is not what's your personal issue and what do you need help with, but rather in order to comprehend the overall picture we're working to paint for you so that you're empowered to take these tools and work with them within your own life. You know, Dr. Tim Hayes is a clinical psychologist that these days does one hour of our radio show Mind Shifters Radio, and then uh, Jeannie and I do the second hour. Originally, we were doing the radio show, and Dr. Tim was a listener. He had, as a psychologist, had worked with these tools, and he started listening to the show, and he'd make comments on occasion, and he ended up becoming a co-host for several years, and then one day he said, hey, Michael, I'm ready to take off and, and do another hour of the show, so we you know, divided it up, and he takes the first hour, and I take the second, but as a clinical psychologist, what Dr. Tim uh, shared was his attraction to this work, and he's been doing it now for about, oh, geez, I don't know, probably 20 years. But he said what the attraction was is as a clinical psychologist, he'd hear about, you know, this famous psychologist or this famous psychiatrist who just got miraculous results with people. And he, along with many of his friends and colleagues, would go to that person's workshop or go to study with that person so that they could do it too. And he said, you know, like nobody was very rare, was it? that anybody could actually do what that famous psychologist or psychiatrist was able to do with people. And what really impressed him with these, with this set of tools, and this is what I've worked to develop for the last 50 years, is that he could take this tool and hand it to anyone. And anyone could produce the same results as Michael Rice or Yinka or Dr. Tim Hayes. 
that you could hand the tool. And if someone would take the time to build the brain cells to study and understand the work and then actually apply the tools, they could produce the same result as the quote unquote expert. And, you know, for me, that was one of the greatest compliments I could ever have, because that was my objective to, to create something that we could hand to anyone and they could do it. So my question is whether you have questions about the principles, not your specific issue, because we're, we're not here today. You know, the next time we do another worksheet, if you happen to be the volunteer that works with it, then, you know, great. Then, then we'll get to specifics. But, but here, in a general way, are there any questions on the first 15 chapters of the book that we've covered that you need understanding with in order for us to move forward? Anyone have a question for us? You, if you raise your hand, if you do. My hand is up. Oh, oh, it's been up the whole time. I didn't realize it was up for, I thought it was Yes, yes. Okay. It's up. Yes. Hi, Michael. It's lovely to see you again. Um, yes, I love your work, as you know. And, and I was fortunate enough to do a spin off with Grady on the, the work. I'll call it the work. And, wonderful. and I think it's so wonderful. Um, and I am going to share something that happened to me yesterday as well. Um, my mother passed away on Tuesday night. Hmm. However, bless you and bless her. Oh, yeah. Holding you. you both in our hearts. Bless you, bless you. But that's not what I'm sharing for. Um, so yes, yeah, so as a result of this spin-off group, I've carried it on because I think these worksheets are wonderful. So I now host my own little Zoom meeting and we do wonderful. these worksheets, right? Once a week and uh, on a Wednesday. And my question is, um, how do we dig into the deeper stuff? You know, we do these worksheets, we answer the questions, we get through them. But how can I encourage my, my <clears throat> participants and myself to go deeper, please? Well, you know, if, if one wants to go deeper, one has to commit oneself to doing the work on a deeper level. You know, and let me give you an example. And I don't think I've talked about this in the in the book studies yet. But several years ago, I had bought a new computer. And when I received the computer, unpacked it, plugged it in, it didn't work properly. So I called the manufacturer of the computer. They put me on the phone with technical support. And I don't remember now how many hours. It was hours, three, four, five hours I spent with technical support and they couldn't get it working. So I'll pack it back up and send it back to us and we'll fix it. So I packed it back up, I sent it back and they ostensibly fixed it. I get it back again, I plug it in. It doesn't work properly. I call tech support again, more time on the phone, pack it up, send it back, they'll fix it. I get the computer back again, I plug it in and it still doesn't work. The manufacturer couldn't get it working. I have a friend uh, who was a, he's now passed. This, this goes back 20 some years ago. And this friend was a former NASA computer scientist. And he's got two or three businesses. And, you know, he's a student friend. I know him through him attending my workshops and we just became friends. And uh, I don't bother him because he's got so much on his plate, but I was kind of, you know, like I got to get this thing working. So I called this Graham, he was in Kansas City or lived at that time in Kansas City. I said, Graham, I got this computer and I have this problem. And, you know, the manufacturer can't even, you know, I sent it back to them twice. He says, okay, he says, you in front of the computer? Yep. And he says, okay, type in this string of characters at a C prompt. This was back before Windows. So I type a string of characters in that he tells me to type. He says, hit a return, and I do. And he says, read to me what's on the screen. So I read it to him. He says, okay, type this into the computer, hit a return, tell me what it says on the screen. And I tell him, I read the characters on the screen. It's okay, type this in, your computer's fixed. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait, wait a minute, Graham. Uh, 
you, you can't be serious. I mean, the, com the computer's been back to the manufacturer twice. You gotta be kidding me. He said, Michael, your computer is fixed. And you know what? My computer was fixed. Now, this man is a former NASA computer scientist. Do you have any idea how many tens of thousands of hours of NASA computer scientists have spent in front of computers studying and working with computers? Do you want to go to depth with this work? Here's what I suggest you do. You pretend that you're getting ready to go back to university and you're going to get a PhD. Or you're going to get yourself an MD degree, or you're going to get yourself a JD, a lawyer's degree, an Esquire, as you would in England. And then you dedicate, if you, so if you're going to do that, you're going to dedicate yourself to at least the next seven or eight or nine years of college. And you're going to spend hours a day working with it. You're going to write exams. You're going to develop the brain cells to become an expert in that. And then, you know, today, I bet right now, if I had Tiger, does everybody there know who Tiger Woods is? He's one of the top, you know, at least in the past he has been, he's had some problems recently, but he's one of the top golfers in America. But you know, so if I had Tiger Woods cell phone number right now and I called it, I bet dollars to donuts, he's on the golf course right now. He's either playing in a tournament or he's practicing chipping or he's practicing putting or he's practicing driving a ball. And that's why he's able to go to the deeper level of playing golf. My friend Graham, that's why he was able to go to the deeper level of uh, fixing computers. And what I hear you telling me is you want to go to the deeper levels of this work. Now, most everybody who runs into this work says, I want to go to the deepest levels of this, Michael, and I have $5 and five minutes. Tell me everything you know. And guess what? You can't get away with that. I would suggest that you go back and start with, the, you go to our website, whyagain.org. And in the middle of the page, you'll see a, a microphone. Click on the microphone, drill down, and go back to the first radio show from 11 years ago. Now, in that 11 years, five days a week, a minimum of, of an hour a day for 11 years, there is a whole body of teaching. When you finish those 11 years, you'll be well on your way to your PhD in doing this work. If you're not willing to do that, don't expect to be at a PhD level of doing this any more than you'd expect to be at a PhD level at you know, philosophy or psychology or an MD or a JD, because you're not going to have it. This, you know, what a lot of people don't realize about this work is we are literally answering, we're asking and answering literally the question of life that has puzzled millions of minds for thousands of years trying to figure it out. And the ego mind says, yeah, well, okay, five bucks, five minutes, tell me the whole thing. It's not going to happen that way. You're going to dedicate yourself and you're going to work on a daily basis ultimately for several hours. And when I first started doing this work, it was a part-time thing for me. I taught, I, I began to learn it and then I started to teach it part-time. I was in the business world at that point. I actually had three businesses. I had 60 employees. I had an El Dorado on one side of my driveway and I had a Mark III on the other. And I had a, a penthouse apartment in one city and homes in two other cities. And one day, I had the guidance to walk away from all of that. I went back to school. I got rid of the Eldorado, the Mark III, the three businesses. I actually bartered taking care of a small apartment building for a one-room apartment that I could live in while I was going to school. That was hmm, 42, 43 years ago. And it has been my full-time occupation ever since. There are times that, you know, there's, there's a link in one of the things that you can consent out for the, the latest three-hour version of why is this happening to me again. There are times when I've taught that workshop three times in a single day. 
and this has been my full time and i'm talking you know sometimes 14 16 18 hours a day my full time study for the last you know it was part time for the first 6 or 7 years and then for the last 42 or 43 it's been my full time occupation that's why I can field your questions. That's why I can support you going through things. And if you want that, then what I just explained is what you're going to have to do. Now, most people aren't interested in going that far. But if you're interested in going that far, that's what you're going to have to do. Otherwise, you know, what I've done is the best I can do. You know, my original work was actually in the field of electronics. And, and when you built a piece of electronic equipment or you designed a piece of electronic equipment or you repaired one, it didn't matter much what your philosophy was. It had to work when it came off the bench on the other end. And so what I've done with this tools, because that's like, that's the grounding that I have in understanding is I've worked to make each of the tools accessible to people. And what you're going to have to do to make them yours is engage them and use them and enter into the practice. And the deeper you want your skills to be, the more committed you're going to have to be to doing it. And that's just what it takes. Not everybody's going to go, you know, whole hog, full time, give up their businesses or their careers or their jobs. I did do that, and I did that in order to do my best to short circuit what it takes to develop the skills to use these tools. Start with the radio archives. You know, we do every once a month, uh, the second Saturday of the month, we're actually doing one uh, this Saturday. We do a workshop called Mind Shifters and Still Point Breathing. It's a once a month thing. And, you know, if you want to take your work to the next level, then you might want to join that particular workshop series. We have a, a codependence to interdependence self-study intensive, which includes 90 hours of self-study video and goes to depth with many of these tools, not all of them, but many of them. We cover the why is this happening to me again workshop, healing through relationships, communication, did you hear what I think I said, and codependence to interdependence. That's a course that we sell as a self-study. You can do that whole course and it includes what we call a personal code evaluation, which is based on the thing called the MMPI, which is a Minnesota multiphasic personality inventory. It's considered to be the gold standard of psychological testing. So our personal code evaluation is based on the MMPI and it gives people feedback in 10 areas of their lives about how well or how poorly their minds are working. So there's a personal code evaluation included in that codependence to interdependent self-study. You start out with that and we'll give you specific things. Here are some of the things that you can do. That course would be like doing your first year of university if you really want to develop these skills. You know, when I spoke about getting your PhD, that would be like doing the first year of university. It's a self study program. There are 90 hours of video work, very intense, using the tools, learning the tools, engaging in the uh, question answer sessions, the processing work that we do, which is all about developing the skills. And then when you complete that course, then you can you, you have a second personal code evaluation where you can look at where your changes and improvements have been. You'll, you'll be able to assess yourself and exactly how far you've come. And then it gives you your next series of challenges for your post course work. So that might be something that you might want to do. The cost of that course, lock, stock, and barrel, including the evaluations, is $600. It's 90 hours of really powerful, intensive work. So that might be another way to, uh, if you want to take your, really take your skills to the next level. And, you know, the archives are there. So, so there are free ways to do it. There are paid ways to do it. We're simply here to support. The other thing to do, and... You know, if you don't have U.S. telephone service free, then uh, you can go to your computer and log in uh, at Radio Showtime. 
it's from one till two o'clock. Well, actually from noon till two o'clock Eastern time. And you can be a participant in the live radio show five days a week from noon to one o'clock Eastern time in the United States, which is five hours earlier than uh, London time. You can tune into the radio show. The first hour, you can listen to Dr. Tim present, and the second hour will be myself and Jeannie. Do that five days a week. And again, if you don't have U.S. telephone service, you can simply, you know, li link into it with your computer and listen on your computer. You can set up an account with Blog Talk Radio. It's a simple thing. doesn't cost anything. They're very private with the information. I've never seen them abuse anybody's information. And you can uh, get into the chat room. So if you can't talk by telephone because you're you know, somewhere in the world where you don't have uh, telephone service to the U.S., you can ask questions in the um, chat room and we'll answer them live on the show. So that's another way to engage and deepen your relationship with the tools and the understanding. Also on your telephone, if you go to your app on your telephone, you can uh, download or pardon me, go to your app store on your telephone. You can download our forgiveness app and all you do is go into your app store and type in the words Heartland, H-E-A-R-T-L-A-N-D, Aramaic, A-R-A-M-A-I-C, forgiveness. If you do that, you'll be looking at a kind of a reddish icon with a heart. That's our app. Download it. You can start to do the worksheets right there on the app. And on every page of the app, there's a, a button you can push. And if you have questions, these are something I don't understand. I don't know how to do this. All you do is hit that button, type your question in, hit send. It'll go to Jeannie. Jeannie will read it on the next radio show and will answer it. You leave her your email address and Jeannie will write you back and say, here's the time code where you're question was answered on this date on this day go to the archives and she'll send you a link to it so that's another way to engage so you know there are the different ways to engage in it the reason that you know the company that i bought that computer from couldn't fix is because they obviously had not engaged deeply enough in working with computers even though we're a computer manufacturer the reason Graham was able to do it is because as a former NASA computer scientist, he'd engaged beyond anything I could even comprehend. I mean, I was just shocked when, I mean, he had me do two or three actions on the computer and says, Michael, your computer's fixed. And I was like, that's impossible. But it was fixed. So you've got to develop the brain cells. You've got to engage. You've got to interact. And, and when I say interact, you know, many people want to study things. Oftentimes, what I'll say to people is, stop, don't study that. Learn forgiveness. This work isn't about having all this information in your head. This work is about having this understanding and having awakened this state of being in your heart. You know, the most, there are two brains they've identified, actually three, with the two main ones in the human body are the one that's between your ears, and then they've identified a second brain in the heart. Until the heart brain is connected to the head brain, there is no true knowledge. And this work is designed to connect the heart brain to the head brain and support you in experiencing yourself as a human being, as the, the created essence of love that you are, and expressing your life from there. That's when, when you do that, that's the day you get to walk across the stage with your hat and gown and you get your PhD certificate in being. Does that make sense, Gina? <laughs> oh, gratitude for making me laugh. What an in-depth- Well, laugh. you asked. I you asked, <laughs> and, and guess what? And guess what, Gina? Gina, right. I'm yes. not laughing. <laughs> I'm as serious as a heart healing. Right. Wow. So that's what it takes. A, so engage, engage in some heavy work. Really, is is the that's, answer. That's what it takes. 
in a nutshell. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. Gratitude cool. for the answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks for answering the asking the question and give me the opportunity to answer. It's a good one. Got it's like, you know, this is the question of life. For, I mean, for millions of people over thousands of years, and, and, and most people want the answer in two minutes or less. And it's just, it's not the way it works. I mean, it literally is. This work is about undoing, for most people, the foundation of hostility or fear from within themselves, from within their cultural systems, from within their own genetics and their family history. Undoing those things and stepping into the space where rather than functioning out of that as their foundation, which, you know, the stage we're at as human beings, virtually everyone in the world has been fooled. They've been fooled into thinking that the pictures their minds generate based in hostility or fear are, are something valuable and something real and something true. And it's all a fraud. But if you're fully engaged in that which most everybody on the planet is i mean personally you know to be able to explain forgiveness as i explain it to you now i started working with it i started working with the aramaic forgiveness process the core of this worksheet and developed my first worksheet about for 43 years ago but what I can now, what I have explained to you, you know, and we've done it several times about the core of forgiveness, how it works, why it works, and what it does. It took me 35 years. And again, at times, I taught that workshop three times. It took me that long to understand it. Now, hopefully... The way that I put it together short circuits the process for you. I mean, when I think about our first conversation, Gina, back when we first started doing this book club and the turmoil that you're in and what was going on, and now I listen to you in a pretty centered space and you're actually bringing this work to people, you've done that. Like, what's that been? Six months? And I mean, going that's, through another grief that's a lifetime of mother. work, Gina. <laughs> Say again. And now going through my mum's passing right now as well, yeah. Michael. Do you know, I found out yesterday morning at 10 past seven, it was the night before it happened. She was got put in a nursing home by my brother. I won't go there. And I still had the meeting and still did the worksheet on my anger around the situation you know i i think these and how i preface these meetings is these worksheets are magic yeah they are just magic. they're miraculous mm. and 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 here's my take without forgiveness the world is lost in turmoil it is the single tool that takes people out of the world of trauma into the world of being, even when things like what you're describing, I mean, geez, that's, you know, 24 hours ago to 30 hours ago, you learned that your mom passed. And I hear the centeredness in your voice. I hear the potential for pain, but you haven't gotten lost in that. And that's just a sign of the work that you've done in just a few months that you've been engaged in this. So, you know, I think it's awesome. And, and I personally receive it as a compliment because the average person, if they'd run into this work before we put it together like this, uh, it'd be years before they'd be able to start to make movements like that. So congratulations and nice work. Wow. Praise indeed. Much gratitude, sweetheart. Gratitude for joining us and for all that hard work for four, the last 43 years as well, Michael. Appreciation. It's been my blessing. All right, young lady. Good to say hello. Okay. So, Miss Yinka, do we have anybody else with a hand up? Yes, we have Carla with a question. Great. Let's say hello. Hi, Michael. Good night. And I have to thank you a lot because um, for years, people have been telling me about, about forgiving other people. And I'm just like, I don't understand how that works. I don't okay, understand. Okay, well, can I, can I get you to hold for just one second? Yeah. So, I'm going to change that instruction right off the bat. Don't ever forgive anybody, including yourself, for anything. Please well, never, ever forgive anyone. But well, that's what we're doing. Well, hold on, be with me for a minute. But, oh, but forgive continuously. 
never forgive anyone, but continue forgiveness, forgiveness and continue it every day. Now, what I mean by that is we have been told a lie. You know, Vladimir Lenin, the man who, you know, initiated communist philosophy, is probably responsible for more deaths on planet Earth than any human being ever in existence. And he said this, if you want to destroy a culture, change the meaning of its words. A culture of forgiveness is a culture that knows that if there's pain inside of us, there's a tool called forgiveness with which I go inside myself and remove the root of my pain so that I'm free of it. Do that work continuously. Forgive continuously. And we live in a culture that's taught us a Greek idea. They changed the meaning of the word, and it's taught us a Greek idea that forgiveness is about how I should let you off the hook because there's pain inside of me, that I should forgive you because my physiology, my nervous system is producing pain. Now, when you think of it that way, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. Why would I be having anything to do with you if my nervous system is producing pain? Obviously, I need to heal my nervous system. So forgiveness is a tool with which you go inside yourself and heal your own nervous system. It has nothing to do with letting other people off the hook. So what happened is the Greeks took this idea of forgiveness and turned it into pardoning. Let them off the hook. And, and if you want to pardon someone because, you know, they've done something crazy, and if your pain is resonated by that craziness, pardon them, let them off the hook, then take the forgiveness tool and go inside yourself and remove your pain. Now you've got the best of both worlds. But this idea of forgiving other people or forgiving yourself is totally and completely false. Does that make sense? Of, it does, of course it does, because with that um, other um, other idea of forgiving, um, the pain would still be there, and I would be like, "Why is this person still in my mind? Why am I feeling this way?" You know, I was like, "Right." Taught. And then I started to do these worksheets, and it's just like as I do them, the pain goes away, and because I used to hold people in my thoughts with things that has happened and I couldn't understand what was going on. I know they're not feeling what I'm feeling. So it's not about anything with them. It's something, it has to be something with me, but because of the teaching, I didn't understand that until now when I'm hearing everything from you. So this is like, Sweet. you have, pardon me? All right. So, Sweet, so that's you, awesome. So you have allowed me to release a lot of pain and, um, and I'm trying to continuously work on it. So I had a set of sheets that I, I printed and I started to work on the sheets and it became a bit cumbersome. And then I you started to talk about the app. So I started to use the app and that was like beautiful. So, um, there, but what I noticed too is that, you see when, when we do, when, when it asks about what, fe what feelings resonate, there would be so many feelings sometimes. And then they ask about what thoughts came up and there would be so many thoughts. So I tried to jot down it or try to put it in my notes. I have a little note on my phone called forgiveness notes so that I could go back and do sheets. But there's something else that came up with a sheet as well. And, and I think it's 60 that asks you about your goals. What, who have you not fulfilled these goals with? And- right. That and all brought up things, and I was just like, oh, so is, does this have something to do with how I feel today as well? And I said, I have to go and do a sheet for that as well. So, yes. So you, you know, there are, there are Sorry. archives. There are archives on our website from the radio show. And... In the archives, there's a special set of, of radio shows where we've actually walked somebody step by step through the worksheet process. There are about 20 or so of those shows. 
the one I think is it's the second one on the list was a worksheet that we did 11 years ago with a woman named Magda. Actually, she was on our radio show today. And Magda had an issue around her significant other, and she asked for help in doing a worksheet. We call this type of worksheet the Hydra worksheet. And if you remember in Greek philosophy, there was this creature, the Hydra, and when you cut off her head, out of the stump of her neck, several more heads would grow. And so oftentimes you'll hit a Hydra worksheet. And when you knock out one issue, all of a sudden you'll see that beneath and supporting that one issue, there were 10 other issues. And so you've got 10 other worksheets. And you start doing those 10 other worksheets and they lead to other worksheets. That's called the Hydra. In this particular radio show, and you might want to listen to it, it's kind of fun to listen to, it's entertaining. And it's powerful to, to really recognize what's going on. But this woman, when we did this worksheet with her, she ended up, if I remember correctly, and it's been 11 years, it was the first year of the radio show. From this one worksheet, she ended up, you know, she was making notes through the whole radio show. And if I remember correctly, I believe she had 17 different worksheets to do from that one. So that's quite normal to get a Hydra, where when you take one thing out of the way, the mind, you know, takes this projection and it distracts us with it. And we don't notice what's going on under the surface. The beauty of doing the worksheet process and writing is you get to start to notice what's going on under the surface. And that's where the healing happens and where the healing needs to be done. Um, thanks. I'll look for that. Yes, I the second one and you first, the second recording that you had in the archives, right? Which is in, the, in, the, in, the, in the radio, in the, in the radio show, Jeannie's got, my wife's got a separate set of worksheets that are where um, we did, or pardon me, a separate set of radio shows where we did worksheets with people. So if you find that, so if you go down into the archives and you find that section, um, and uh, I'm not sure how to describe how to get to it, but if you go to whyagain.org and you click on the, the um, microphone, then you look down the list. I think she has it listed there, worksheet radio shows. And if you click on that, the second one in that list is the one where we went through it with Magda and she ended up with 17 different worksheets to do out of that one. And it's very instructive. Okay. Um, all right, thanks for that. And there are two more questions I wanna ask you if it's okay. Um, one, there was, I was listening to you at one point in time and you said that you went to Barbados did you do your work in Barbados as well? Did you do this? I did, yes. Barbados? Yes, that um, was back, my goodness, that was, uh, whew, I don't even remember how many years ago, probably 17 or 18 years ago, I was in Barbados. Actually, we, we made it in the paper. I, I did some stuff with uh, uh, the school system. The government invited me into the schools and we actually made it, I made it in the paper as man of the week in the, one of the local newspapers for, for uh, presenting in the schools and such, the forgiveness process. That was a fun trip. Barbados, a beautiful country. Well, the reason why I ask is I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm thinking, how will people receive this kind of, uh, how will people receive this in, a, in my country, right? Which is Trinidad Wonderfully. Tobago, I've been it? to Trinidad yeah. and Tobago. Oh, right. I've been there and done the work there. Yes, yes. That goes back oh. even further than Barbados. But yes, I did do that. There was actually a, uh, a man who was a travel agent. I forget his name now, but about 30 years ago, he tapped in this work and he brought me to Trinidad and Tobago twice uh, to uh, to teach this work. Because the trauma is increasing a lot, a lot um, in our youths. And I think this would help so much. Um, so that's why I was asking, you know, but what I wanted to do was, you, you know, you know, you spoke about a book by Miss, um, I think her name was 
a book. Julie? That, uh, Julie, yes. Have a For skip. children, healing children, loving yeah. children. Right. So I'm a teacher as well. So I'm thinking of introducing it into my classes. Well, my, I'm, it sounds like a primary school that was written for primary school, but I wanted to Perfect. do it with my form three class, right? But right. I'm a bit, um, I'm not too sure if I would be able to, well, I don't know what, I haven't seen the book as yet. I said I want to order it and go through it. Right. But I don't know what kind of, um, what what it will bring up and if I can handle, because uh, some of our students go through a lot of trauma and I don't know if I would be able to help them when things come up. Um, yes. You know? So the, I'm the book, thinking. as a teacher, the book will give you a complete, I mean, Julie was an awesome kindergarten and grade one teacher. She developed seven levels of worksheets, age appropriate, language appropriate. The first one is very simple, step-by-step. Step. She goes through seven different levels up to early teen years for using the worksheet. And she does, I've had many teachers over the years who've taken her book and have really, you know, been able to take the tools and bring them into the classroom. So yes, you, it will support you and empower you to be able to take this work and, and bring it forward in that arena. Of course, as you practice with it, you'll become more and more skilled, but, uh, but yes, it will work. It will. I've had many teachers who've taken it and used it over the years. Okay. All right. And that would be awesome to do because that's really where we all need to start is with the children. That's so important. What Julie used to do, there's a, there's a piece in the, uh, in the book on who am I? And then there's a thing called my commitment. At the beginning of the year, Julie would put that on her, uh, her, one of her blackboards and she'd share with the kids. Now these are kindergartners and grade one students. And she'd say, you know, this is the primary thing that we're here to learn. This is what we're here to do is to take these tools and, or to take this particular understanding and make it real for you as a student. One of the things she did in the early years of doing this in the school system is she had t-shirts made for her students with this, with the commitment on it. And I know she shared with me that there was a point where uh, about three years uh, after uh, she had given out those t-shirts to a class. One of the third grade kids came in one day and of course it was much bigger than the little tiny t-shirt that she gave out to him when he was in kindergarten. But uh, he came into her class and he went to thank her and he was wearing his t-shirt from kindergarten underneath his regular shirt. And he came into her classroom and picked it up to show her that he still had that and at at you know at that age in uh in you know third grade he was still valuing what he'd gotten from her in kindergarten and i just went and got a hold of the book and here's one of the things that she would put on the blackboard at the beginning of the year who am i i am somebody i am bright capable and lovable i am teachable and learn easily I tell the truth and I'm a gentle listener. I respect myself and others. I am cooperative and responsible for my feelings and choices. I see the highest and best in myself and others and support that with my thoughts, words, and actions. I use time wisely because it's valuable. I'm the best me I can be each day. I am somebody. I am love. Now, I don't know about you or anybody else that's listening, but I can certainly identify with how different my life would have been much earlier than it was if somebody had told me that at kindergarten level. If I had the brain cells for that in kindergarten, any of us who are listening to this right now, how different would your life be? if your life had started out with that. So yes, take it, 
hand it to kids. I, I don't know what shipping for the book would be to uh, to Barbados, but we've shipped it all over the world. So, you know, here is here's the other thing that she would write on the board. And this is my promise to you. So this was the behavior model. She'd put it on one section of her blackboard at the beginning of the year. I promise to trust you enough to tell you the truth. I promise to treat you lovingly, gently, and with respect in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I promise to remember that being connected to love and being friends with you are the most important things to me. I promise to always hold love in my heart and reconnect to that love if you or I am not feeling loving. I promise to be open and gentle as we each talk about our painful feelings and join in healing them. I promise to listen, speak, cooperate, and be responsible for my realities. I promise to choose to get along with you and to create a loving friendship. I will keep my promises to you. So kindergarten kids would come into our classroom for their first time, and that would be a full chalkboard in her classroom. And she'd read it to them and say, this is the first thing we're here to learn in this classroom. And that came before academics or anything else. And the result she produced with her kids was monumental. Yes, you can absolutely do that. And we'll certainly be there to support you in any way we can. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. It's delightful that you're even thinking about doing that with kids. I'm, I'm, I could jump for joy for the kids in Barbados to have you as a teacher. Because when you, I mean, when I just think about, you know, I think about those words. I mean, that's, that's basic. That's based on a commit, commitment that took me about 15 years to write those ideas. And then she took it and put it in the kids form. And, and it's reflective of my own process. It took me about 15 years, you know, I came across this, you know, a, a chunk of the way through my life, this understanding of what, what life is really about. And, and I think about, my God, how different would it have been if I'd have had these, just these few basic sentences given to me at five years of age? Wow. I mean... I can't even fathom what life would have been from the ages of five to 30, but they'd have sure been different than what they were. <laughs> In her book, so, she yes. has all the different types of worksheets. Say it again. All in her book, she has worksheets for all different levels in her book. Yes. Yes. She has, right. she developed age and language appropriate seven different worksheets and then she has a uh the, there's a 12-step version of the worksheet as well for adults all, all of that's in the book and the explanation of how she used it as well as the the target you know in aramaic you know we've talked about the idea that in aramaic the word sin is actually an archery term it's got nothing to do with theology or religion it's an archery term, and when you fired at the target, and if you missed the bullseye, the scorekeeper would yell sin, which just meant you were off the mark. So she she never had uh, classes where somebody failed. She had a target, and A was always on target. B would be beside the target. C would be close to the target. D would be uh, wait a minute, D, I'm not remembering what D was. F would be far from the target. Oh yeah, and D would be darn far from the target. So if somebody got a D, they were darn far from the target. And so the kids would come back and they go, oh, I'm far from the target. I need to learn something to get on target rather than, oh, I'm a failure. Look at that, I got a D. She totally changed, I mean, there's to give the kids this foundation of Oh, I'm a human being. I'm love and, and, and I'm supposed to function as love. That's what it's about. 
So I'm excited about this part of the conversation in particular that you're considering that in, uh, in Trinidad and Tobago. That would be awesome. Well, three months from now, for the next term, I'll tell you how it goes. Awesome. I'll be interested and excited to do it. And, and you know, you might also download the app. So you've got an easy way. If any questions come up as you're doing it, you know, I'm in, in conversation with Julie all the time. So if there's any way that uh, or anywhere that you have questions from the app, you can just hit a button, send us a question, we'll get it and I'll make sure we get the answer back to you. Oh, I have the app already. So I'll, Great. Yes, I'll definitely use it like that. Thank you so much. Thanks for that support because there's a bit of a bit afraid <laughs> so, of venturing into that little there. So yeah, thank you very much. Great. And one of the things you might want to do is listen to the archives of today's radio show. There's actually a, a man who had come to our teaching center recently who had heard about our work and he's been there for a few months and uh, he's really become engaged with the tools. And he, he, he actually had it shared on the radio or in our conversation this morning that he had a vision of himself teaching the work. And the reason for that was there's a, another woman who lives right near Heartland. There's a couple who had met through this work and they actually bought a farm just a mile or so from our center in order to be close to Heartland. And it was, his conversation with her that really inspired him and moved him in the direction of doing the work and so uh she was on the show today it's magda that did that uh, um, hydra worksheet back 11 years ago she's really been diligently using the work and so on the radio show today i acknowledge her for her part in getting this man to really open up and use the tools and suggested that she might want to start a support group working with people with them and the issue that we covered was her thought disorder that, oh, I couldn't do that. I'm not good enough. Uh, I'm afraid I, I wouldn't be good enough to do that. So that was our conversation. We actually gave her a mind shifter, and that was the process of our radio show today. So that one, in the context of this conversation, that may, might be a really meaningful show for you to listen to in our archives today. Okay. I would second cool. that Carlo as well because I was there. I listened to today's one, so I'd second listening to that today. That was a great conversation with Magda, wasn't it? I just was like, ah, I love it. Okay. Cool. Sweet well, young lady. Well, we look forward to working with you and supporting you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Michael. Thank you for all that you have done. Thank you very much. You're most welcome and deserving. <laughs> all right Ms. Yenka that's it for the question so we'll go into the um PowerPoint. let's go for chapter 16 so yes so i'll just uh, quickly previous conversations from the book with michael and richard richard original dilemma was broken relationship and marriage richard's emotions with frustration and anger and fear in previous session, Richard learns the power words have when we change or don't know its true meaning. Michael took a look at the meaning of sin, simply meaning off the mark, as he just spoke about, and the impact was having to Richard's life, believing it meant he was wicked or had done evil, as he was taught and had believed, really realising how much of his life was tied up in guilt and fear. That was the previous session that we've had. Chapter 16 Healing, Abuse, and Victimhood. There are no victims, only volunteers. We volunteer with the realities we hold. So we're just going to take a look at. Uh, there. Richard becomes aware that he purposely plays the victim to keep people from victimizing him. I am the victim, says Richard. So this is just for you to have a go. In what area of your life are you or have you become comfortable in the role of being the victim? Can you recognize in your life, you might want to jot it down for the rest of the session, of in what areas of your life are you or have you become comfortable in the role of being the victim? 
So I'm just going to give you a minute with that. And as you're looking at that, make sure that you're breathing. Notice that if asking that question of yourself or Yinka asking that question, if that changes your breathing pattern at all. It certainly did for me today while I was creating it. <laughs> Definitely a big question. I'm just going to take you into the next question. What benefit did you get from playing the role of the victim? What benefit do you get from playing the role of the victim? About 20 seconds left with that one. Then click on to the next side. Changing the foundations of relationships from fear and anger to love. So some of us may need to dig into those foundations of our relationships. All of us. Yeah. <laughs> I've just been playing. You know, we, we say some like maybe somebody's escaped. <laughs> yeah. I... I I can't count many people I've worked with over the last 45 years. I've never met anybody. I don't care whether they're the billionaire class. I've worked with a few of those or they're in the mud. There isn't anybody that's escaped this dynamic on the planet. So the power you regain from no longer blaming or being the victim becomes available for you to consciously re recreate your life. This is a very short one. 
Would you like to no longer be the victim of your life? Simple yes or no. Would you like to no longer be the victim of your life? And guess what? It's so simple. Um, notice I said simple, not easy. <clears throat> but all you have to do is start to look at all of the energetic patterns, all of the frequencies that you've held in your life and recognize that you're a creator. And as a creator, through the energetic patterns that you hold, you literally create your life. And recognizing that when, when people create things that they'd rather not have, there's a tendency to deny ownership. You know, when, when, probably one of the greatest atrocities done to us, <clears throat> pardon me, down through the ages and that most of us have bought into, is that we've had hidden from ourselves the fact that we are by nature creators. And, and everybody loves that idea when the creation's going well. But when the creation's not going so well, they always know who the problem is and their name is invariably them. If only they'd be different. Have you got somebody in your life that you're saying, oh, if only they were different, my life would be great? Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> it's the biggest lie that's ever been told. You are the creator of your life. Yes, you draw other people in to carry out your creative patterns, but you're the one who sources those patterns. And if you deny ownership of them, then you literally dissociate from their cause. And in so doing, you create for yourself an unnatural mind. And the unnatural mind is called the unconscious. Once we hide things from ourselves, and you know, if you talk to the psychologists today, they'll tell you that as much as 90, 95, perhaps 98% of our thinking is unconscious. If someone's at the 98 point percentage point unconscious thinking, that means that 98% of their lives, they're creating unconsciously. They have no idea they have a part in it. And what the forgiveness technology does is it restores you to awareness of your own unconscious. And each place where you're restored to awareness of your own unconscious, you get to stop functioning unconsciously. You get to clean out those patterns. So this, this whole chapter is about healing, abuse, and victimhood. And, and that means looking at and healing the part that you play in your own victimhood. Because if someone resonates the part of the mind that holds your victimhood, and, and if you've experienced victimhood in your life, that mind is yours, you, what happens when you're in denial is that when someone resonates that part of your mind, you use that data to build your brain's image of them, and presto, when you do that, you get to join the one world religion. You know, there's a big conversation in the culture, a lot of fear mongering that goes on about this satanic thing that's going to happen in this one world religion that wants to take over the world. But guess what? The one world religion took over the, the world centuries ago. It's called the religion of blame, guilt, and victimhood. Look what they've done to me. Take a look around and tell me where you don't find that religion being practiced. So victimhood, as Richard believed, was a protection, is not a protection from punishment and blame because the act of playing the victim is punishment itself. A lot of people get their attention and it's, it's a way, you know, being a victim is a way of of taking control and the way people do that is they take control with the with the um, accusation look how you've hurt me or you'll be sorry when you see what you've done to me 
Now that one's personal experience. I, I can remember when I used to do that. You'll be so sorry when you see what you've done to me. And, and it's a way of controlling people. And it's foolishness. And you'll notice that all of these victimhood dynamics are based in anger and fear. And if you want relationships based in love, all of that's going to have to go. And remember that forgiveness is about removing what doesn't belong in your mind. So in order to have a life based in love, all you have to do is forgive everything in you that's not based in love. And people say, oh, no, no, you don't understand. It's Bill over there. He's the one that's delivering all this anger and fear. He's the one that's not loving me. Guess what? You wouldn't be with Bill if there wasn't victimhood in you. And the belief that somewhere, how, somewhere, you deserved anger. You know, the first day you'd met Bill or, you know, Mary or whatever their name is, the person you're currently thinking is the problem in your life, the first day you met them, if you were not in resonance with the pain they could inflict on you, if there wasn't a part of you ready to play there, you'd look at them and said, bye, no interest whatsoever, no attraction. So all of that stuff is going to need to be forgiven from within you. And, you know, it can be painful and traumatic when you turn your power over to victimhood. And in, as, as Yinka just said, that one, one uh, um, picture was that when you heal your victimhood, all the power that you've locked into that part of your unconscious is restored to you for you to use it creatively. Now, there's a cost to that. That means you're going to have to face it. It means you're going to have to deal with it. So when you become aware of behavior patterns that don't serve you, you're then in a position to change them. And that's empowerment. And pretending that, no, 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 that's not me, that's them, will just leave you stuck in that game. Remember, you're a creator. You have created what's happened in your life. Now, you could write me a book about all the things they did to deliver it to you. But creation is nothing but delivery of what energetic patterns you hold within yourself. So for many people, the pain and their hostility and victimhood was the only way they could feel power. And feeling enraged, people go, oh, man, I feel powerful now. Rage, hostility is nothing but a drug. If people are in pain, they anesthetize themselves if they tend to be addictive. Next to busyness, Hostility, I'd offer, is the most common drug on planet Earth. And so my offering is that, yes, it's going to be somewhat traumatic to face those things, to allow them to surface, to own them, and to move through them. But when you start to do that and you move into the, the space where the truth of your being is what you're connected to, the empowerment that comes from love is a hundred times more powerful than that which comes from fear and hostility. So hostility is nothing but a drug. It's an anesthetic. Being anesthetized, people say, oh, I'm feeling no pain. You remember that song, don't you? From you know, <laughs> feeling no pain, feel alcohol. Well, hostility is always a lead drug toward alcohol. You'll notice the alcoholic, how hostile they are. They tried hostility for a long time before they started drinking. And, and actually, if you watch the, the alcoholic, you'll know, you'll know when they're getting ready to go on a binge because they'll start expressing hostility before they do. And when the hostility drug isn't enough to anesthetize their pain, that's when they'll tend to turn to alcohol for a stronger anesthetic. 
Uh, it can be difficult to give up that drug. It's no, it's no different than alcohol. It's tough when somebody's addicted to alcohol to give it up because the underlying pain that alcohol has been anesthetizing, and you know, if you take two molecules of alcohol and take the water out, you've got ether. They can saw bones and you won't feel a thing with ether. Well, that's what alcohol is. So it can be a challenge to start to give it up because when you give up that drug, you'll start to feel what you perhaps won't at first even believe is there. Because you've used the drug for so long. But when you start to let it go, you're going to feel what's underneath it. And it's so worth it. But you've got to stop using the drug of hostility or whatever drugs you use if you're going to heal. And, and our definition of a drug is a drug is any person, place, circumstance, or activity or substance that you use in order to avoid your highest guidance or in order to not feel what's going on inside of you and deal with it. My offering is there is no hostility without deep underlying accompanying pain. And withdrawal can be a challenge. People go through withdrawal from hostility. But you've got to give it up if you're ever going to truly heal. Now, my offering is that you as a human being deserve to live in aliveness joy and delight that's the norm for a human being and anything less is an insult to the human spirit so it's possible my offering is it's possible for every person to have such a life now society has other ideas because there's this this bizarre kind of camaraderie for the hostile mind and hostile people tend to protect their, their own, cherishes others who have that hostility. It's like a, a brotherhood or a sisterhood. Hostility is a deadly drug, as deadly as alcohol is. Now, you'll notice that we live in a culture where the hostility addict can find lots of jobs that will support them. It'll, it'll allow them to take their habit and this, this society becomes the enabler of the addict. You think about it from how many jobs, you know, I don't know exactly what the military budget is in England. It's got to be pretty high. I know it's not nearly as high as here in the States. Half of the budget of this country supports people who live in hostility. I don't know again there about vets coming home what the numbers are, but you know in America uh, something and and they're not keeping very accurate records. It's way more than this, but about twenty five vets are killing themselves every day. <clears throat> so when when we think of the half of the budget of this country is dedicated to something that supports people living in hostility. <clears throat> You know, over the years, and, and I respect the military, and I respect people who've engaged, and you know. But at the same time, it's a training ground that gives people a way to use their hostility that looks heroic. But the drug itself is so destructive, and you even look, you know, policing. Again, I understand policing over there is much gentler than here, but it's a, it's a great profession for hostility addicts to go into. And even comedy. You know, most comedy is based in hostility. So there are lots of jobs available for the hostile. And that means society is an enabler. What if we started to disappear those jobs and people healed from their hostility?
and they found things to do as creative as the creative presence of love if they found that to do with their lives rather than these jobs that are linked to hostility and you know the culture thinks of those things as normal it's kind of like you know a fish lives in water does a fish see the water no it's part of the environment we're, we're working to bring awareness to people these things are so much a part of the environment that it's like, well that's just the way it is that's not the way it is that my offering is is the way we've set it up and each job that it seems in the culture that supports hostility is just a reflection of unresolved childhood traumas that are so widespread that it seems like a natural way of healing. Hostility and fear are not natural for human beings. Just not natural. And sadly, people become what they hate. And maybe it's time for us to heal this hate and hostility. You know, the the culture where, you know, they threw the, the virgin into the volcano to appease the gods. It, from within that culture, that probably looked pretty normal. Oh, that's just what we do. But to practice such vile insanities is crazy. Hostility, fear, hate, intimidation, abuse, and power, tripping can look normal from within our society today or any society that practices such things. But each of those energetic patterns is an horrific assault on the sensibilities of a human life. You know, I'll, I'll have people over the years, I've had people who, when I talk about hostility or, you know, oftentimes the physical abuse that children get. All the people that kind of, you know, proudly say, well, you know, my parents never spoiled or spared the rod and, you know, I turned out okay, never hurt me. It's like, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir. I'd like to take you back to the first minute in your tender sensibility of being love that your parent turned a set of hostile eyes and a hostile voice or a belt to you and tell me that it never hurt you. The hurt is deeper than most people can even fathom. And that's why people drink. And that's why people drug. And that's why people rage. And that's why people stay busy. In order not to look at those things. You know, from within the culture where, gee, they burned people at the stake to save their souls. It probably looked kind of normal and people believed, oh, yeah. That's how, here, I'm going to turn this person in because otherwise they're going to go to hell. So the, you know, the inquisitors will burn them at the stake and that will save their souls. It's like believing that hostility for normal is about as dumb as believing that that's a way to save a soul. How insane can it get? Reason I would offer when not consciously governed can justify anything that it can conce conceive of and anything that it decides to do. Murder, violence, verbal, emotional, physical abuses are kind of considered standard in many relationships and family systems where parents lash out at children. Teachers think it's reasonable in the context of so-called discipline to verbally abuse or attack or put down the children that they're quote unquote teaching. All of that's insane. And if we start to clean our minds up and remove the, the little violences that we do, then life changes. And each one who condones or participates in those little violences is, is a contributor to the violence in the world. It's important to recognize that the tools that you use to produce a result will always produce a result that's just like the tools. You can't get people to a state of love by beating them into it. You might be able to get them to behave as though, but you'll never produce that result. So it's time to heal the structures within ourselves and within our culture. 
any kind of structure that holds it mental, emotional, spiritual, verbal, physical abuse, and hostility or violence in any form within families or communities is natural or normal. It's got to stop. We've got to wake up if we're going to live. Einstein offered the thought that you can't solve a problem with the mind that created it. Hostility in the mind is insane. Fear in the mind is insane. And those things, as Einstein said, are not going to be healed by the mindset that created it. It's only going to be healed when the mindset of love shows up. When the mind is fueled, our, our human minds, I would offer, are designed to be fueled by love. So it's time to have the courage to question everything and do the unthinkable. Question everything. And by so doing, we get to heal abuse and victimhood. And I'll turn it back over to you, young lady. Thank you. Uh, just uh, flick through these slides because you know, Michael's mentioned quite a bit of it. So notice that the truth is safe and healing. Now that you are aware of behavior patterns that don't serve you, you are in a position to change them. That's empowerment. Hostility is one of the most addictive drugs there is. Every person who engages in it needs their fix to keep their pain suppressed. Those who use this drug encourage others to do the same because they themselves have not faced what they have suppressed with their own anger. Often the ra rationalization that we have right to our anger is used to justify holding onto this form of self-abuse. We must be willing to deal with what we have hidden from ourselves and stop using that drug if healing is to occur. Richard in the story without set, um, had a thought of, without my anger though, I am powerless. But hostility is one of the most addictive drugs there is. Hostility must be treated like any other drug. It uses, it uses, must stop if one determines to recover. The other challenge is that society is the enabler. Do drugs suppress pain? If you look at someone who is extremely hostile, you will always find deep emotional pain. Hostility sets up the body's chemistry that suppresses pain. Using hostility is like using any other drug. If one stops using their addictive substance, in this case, their internal chemistry produces, produced by hostility, they will go into withdrawal when the pain craving gets so strong, many return to the supplier for another fix. In traditional drug and alcohol treatment, the enabler is the person who supports the user covering for or assisting him or her in keeping up the habit. Most people use rationalization to avoid facing the cause. They justify addictive behaviors and tolerate it as necessary because of thoughts that justify it. People tend to be so close to what they do, they cannot see their own insanity. Society once ruled by God, sacrificing, burning and torturing people at the stake was not strange from within their belief system. It was a reasonable way to save souls. Reason, 
when not consciously governed can justify anything it can conceive of, anything it decides to do. As Michael said before, Einstein said that you cannot solve a problem with the same mind that created it. The hostile mind is insane and cannot solve its problems. They can only be solved with the mindset of love. After that, we're just going to take a moment to just breathe. So we're going to go into chapter 17. The body has a mind of its own. The reality perceived always comes from the content of the listening mind. The mind is only capable of responding with whatever has been programmed into it. We can dismantle the realities that do not serve us by learning to forgive. So Michael explains to Richard the law of resonance is a law that governs all energy fields and is the law of energy exchange. What is resonance, Richard asks. So I don't know if you want to share a bit more detail on that and before I go into slides, Michael. Can you repeat that, Yinka? So um, Michael explains to Richard the law of resonance is a law that governs all energy fields and is the law of energy exchange. What is resonance, Richard asks? So the law of resonance is pretty simple. And basically what it says is that when two energy fields match with each other, there's an exchange of energy between them, literally an exchange of information. You know, the simplest example you might remember in physics class in high school, you took a middle C tuning fork and you hit it on a desk and you put it in front of a second middle C tuning fork. And that second middle C tuning fork started to vibrate without being touched. What happened? That's the law of energy exchange. That's the law of resonance. And there's a kind of, a, in the human mind, there's a secondary effect of this law of resonance that we call the file folder effect. And the file folder effect basically says that when two files are resonated in the mind at the same time, those files wire together. They literally link to each other. And I use an, a, an example, or I used to use, I don't use it that much anymore. It's, it's there in the book. But, and I, I don't know how it would work, how well it will work with our international audience. But everybody in the United States remembers, or at least, you know, actually the kids don't because it hasn't been around. But they remember, you know, that television used to have a lot of Westerns. And I would ask the question, and some of you might have the brain cells for this, and some of you might not, so it won't be meaningful. I'll explain it a little bit. But I would ask in the class, what's the Lone Ranger's horse's name? The Lone Ranger was a TV program, if you haven't seen it in your country, where, you know, it was this guy who wore a mask, and he was Mr. Good Guy, and, you know, he had his, his you know, famous horse. 
And, you know, I've asked this in many, many audiences here, for those who as kids, you know, watched that TV show, or actually there were several different uh, TV shows that were Westerns that kids used to watch here. And so when I asked the question, what's the Lone Ranger's horse's name? I would always get the answer Tonto, Silver, and Trigger. Now, Tonto was the Indian sidekick of the Lone Ranger. Silver was another Western Star's horse. And Trigger was the Lone Ranger's horse. But all three of those things, due to the file folder effect, were in people's files, so to speak, in their mind on old Western. So when I asked the question, you know, what's this horse's name? Literally, the file folder effect says when you fire one set of brain cells in a file in the mind, everything else in that file starts to fire. So for some people, they come up with the Indian's name. You know, it's maybe been years since they've seen those Westerns, but would come up with Tonto and others would come up with, you know, it was actually Roy Rogers' horse that was silver. And then the Lone Ranger's horse's name was Trigger. But the whole file on old Westerns is resonated. And so those were the answers that would come up. It's a, a good example of that law of resonance. And to recognize, the thing to recognize here is that perception, the constructs of the mind, are nothing but a result of resonance, the firing of brain cells. And when you recognize that perception is a construct of the mind, and that the whole world we think we see is not through seen through the eyes, but is resonated into activity from the content stored within the mind. So we've been told a lie. Virtually everybody in the world believes you know, I looked out and I saw something happen in the world. Excuse me. You have never seen, this. one of the biggest frauds in the world. You've never seen anything with your eyes. You go, cannot, you do not see with your eyes. The eye is nothing but an antenna. It's a receiver for light. Light energies enter into the eye and carry information to the brain. Now, like with every other antenna, you can't see out of the antenna. You don't see out of your eyes. That's a lie of our cultures. Whatever comes into the antenna causes brain cells to fire. And whatever fires in brain cells creates literally the world of perception. We have this device in our minds, which we haven't been talk, told, taught about, that converts thoughts to pictures that converts energy into images. So when something comes in through the eye and we've got brain cells for it, those brain cells fire and our perception is literally a construct of the mind. We see with our brain, not with our eyes. You know, if you've ever been in a courtroom where six different people testified about an accident, you notice that if you listen really closely, it seems like no two of them were at the same accident. Their perceptions, their constructs are so different. So when you recognize that, then you realize that everything that you see is a fabrication of your mind and some things are accurate about what's actually going on and many things are not. So anything that's produced by the mind is produced through resonance and it's a result of the file folder effect. And so our minds, and the mind can't tell the difference between a real and an imagined experience. So if in our, the file in our mind on a particular topic, subject, whatever it is, you know, we've, we've seen people who've been to war and have flashbacks. You know, a, a common one is someone's in kind of the dreamy state, they've been in war and they look up and there's a fan blade going and all of a sudden they're back in Vietnam with helicopters. It's called a flashback. The brain is producing a picture that replaces the actuality. This person's laying at home and in their bed, but they're having a traumatic flashback. This is the essence of what they call PSD. 
And if we understand that the mind, and, and let me put another thought in first, whenever there's hostility or fear, that is telling you that your mind is taking something from the past and generating a picture that it's pretending is the present. Hostility and fear means that the mind is using corrupt data, but through resonance is supplanting the actuality with the reality generated by the mind. And this is the target of our forgiveness work. That whenever the mind is doing that, to apply forgiveness is to remove those energetic pattern. And so obviously everything that's resonated through this file folder effect is from the past. Information has been previously stored and replayed. And those who live in the past are the blind led by the blind as the ancient teaching said and the dead who will be buried by the dead. And you know, the only reason we ever do anything is because there's a reality stored in brain cells that guides us to do that. And and even if notice that even if we said to ourselves, selves, you know, we did this once, we went, oh, that was terrible. I'm never gonna do that again. You notice the next time it's resonated into activity, you do it again. Unless you know how to forgive, unless you know how to go in and remove that from brain cells, the more abhorrent the behavior is and the more you say, I'm never going to do that again, the more assured you are the next time those brain cells fire, you'll do it again. So the only reason we ever do anything is because there's a reality stored in brain cells that guides us to do it. And something through resonance causes that reality to surface and control our behaviors. And the whole purpose of this work and the tools we've developed is to free oneself from the realities that are stored in the mind from the past. And to be able to consciously create behaviors that are in harmony with the truth of who we are as love and the possibility that life truly holds. So forgiveness is about removing realities in the mind from the past, waking up and sourcing our behaviors from the level of existence that we would call being. So to recognize that we have a body-mind unit that is meant to be fueled by active present love becomes one of the key thoughts in this work. And the more skilled we are at staying in that connected space of love, the faster the healing process will proceed. And of course, it takes courage to take on the realities of the past. Some of them are pretty scary, especially when you're uncovering generational issues. Because those energetic patterns are passed from generation to generation. So due to the file folder effect, once pain is hooked up to anything in the mind, that pain can be re-experienced re with anything that it's hooked to in the mind. So whenever that old or that there was that particular set of brain cells that through the file folder effect is linked to fear is resonated bang there's fear whenever there's anger bang there's anger whenever there's hate there's hate if you have fear and anger and hate and you don't like it then you're going to have to develop the skill of going in and being able to forgive it and when you begin to do your work just for the sake of clarity and peace when multiple realities get resonated, the mind can tend to go into overwhelm and that will often inhibit the healing process. And as you continue to do your work, you'll remove those traumatic energetic patterns and the overwhelm aspect that most people go through in doing this is healed. And so as you begin to function more consciously, energies that in the past would have been, which would have been overwhelming, you'll just breathe through and go, oh, here's an, here's an interesting one. And as you breathe through it, it will tend, the energy will tend to, that is at the root of that construct in the mind will tend to dissipate and disappear. 
So the objective of this work is to literally empower people to become conscious of everything in their lives. And people are not conscious operators of their own minds, can be programmed by others to react in any way with any reality in experience, in the experience of any situation. You know, it's called hypnosis. The uncritical acceptance of an idea means that someone via words can plant a suggestion in someone's mind. And if someone uncritically accepts that idea, the mind will turn that into a picture world, into a reality. You know, if you've ever watched the professional stage hypnotist, you know, this person's standing on a, a, a stage. Now, normally, they'd look down with their eyes, light energy would bounce off of the stage, the brain would produce a picture of a stage. Frequency of light carries information about the stage to the mind through the senses. The brain, in response to that, in resonance to that, has the brain cells for this being a stage, so it produces an image of a stage. But if a hypnotist has them in a somnambulistic state and says, you're on the bow of a ship, instead of the light energy coming into the eyes, firing brain cells for stage, the voice of the hypnotist taking precedence sends a message to the brain that we're on the stage, the, the bow of a ship. And the same mind will look down at the stage and see a ship. And they're handed a broomstick and they're told that that broomstick is a fishing pole. And they'll take the broomstick and they'll cast like they've got a fishing pole. And then they're told that they caught a huge marlin and you'll see them struggle and fight just like they were pulling in a marlin. And they're standing there with a broomstick on a stage but they're not seeing that. That's what hypnosis is. And you remember that when the mind is producing a reality, it's producing a reality because there's content for that. And I just saw a question come through this saying, if I get treated this way, does that mean I deserve it? Well, the word deserve, I would interpret as, does that mean I'm to blame? And I would say, absolutely not. You'll notice that the worksheet is a no fault empowerment process. We're not saying you're to blame. We're saying you're responsible. We're saying that everything that comes to you comes to you because there's a frequency in you that produces that result. Are you to blame for that? No, it might be 10 generations old. So responsibility, you'll notice in the word responsibility, there's nothing about blame in the word responsibility. It just means that on some level, there's an energy in me that has resonated or drawn this into my life. When I find that energy in me, when I uncover it with forgiveness and I remove it, then the resonance or the attraction, you've heard of the law of attraction, the thing that attracts that experience to me is now gone because I've forgiven it. I've removed it from my mind. So again, the objective is to empower people. Actually, it really isn't to empower people. It's to help people to uncover the empowerment in themselves because it's always within you become conscious of every energetic pattern that you hold, whether it's from your life or from somebody in your bloodline, remove those energetic patterns so that you only engage in, in energetic patterns that support your life and are on track for your life and on track for the purpose of your life. And when the ancient master said transcend, you know, transcendence wasn't about floating off in space somewhere. It was about getting out of the state of trance, getting out of hypnosis, waking up, removing those patterns. So that's what it's all about, Alfie. What do you think, Ms. Yinka? Yeah, I should take them through the slides. Say it again. I'll show, I'll take you through the slides. Please. Uh, 
So it says, um, I've put front door. I know you've got another car, but I decided to not. I know everyone's not got a car. So don't That's think what? about don't think about the colour of your front door. What are you thinking about? Even if you decide not to think of your front door, which is thinking about your front door, with my words, I set up an energy field. Imagine your mind like a filing cabinet and you have a file on the front door, on front door. My words resonated that file in, on your mind in the same way that a tuning fork resonates and interchanges energy or information. Your mind was stimulated into thoughts about your front door. This action is not thinking at all, but simple, simple resonance. It is the law that governs every process in the mind. Words are frequencies put out by human voice. Our words resonate all information of similar frequencies in the mind that hears them. I call this the file folder effect. The file folder effect is not thinking, it is only information firing brain cells. It is information cycling the body's mind in response to input, words, images, symbols, impulses, or sensations. A young boy with limited realities in his mind might smash a value, valued antique. Is the child destructive? No simply does not have the reality realities in his mind to guide him in what we consider the proper handling of something fragile. If he did not have the tools of forgiveness and undo that reality and was told repeatedly he was bad and destructive, those words may drive him the rest of his life. There is no such thing as a bad child, but many bad children are the product of parents and a culture who don't know any better, nor understand their role in structuring the realities in a child's mind. The world would change overnight if we co comprehended and took responsibility for the realities we allow to be pumped into children's and the goals they present to the innocent minds. He thought, the mind is only capable of responding with whatever has been programmed into it. We can dismantle the realities that do not serve us. So we're going to go into chapter 18, which is clarifying love. If the offspring of an elephant is an elephant and the offspring of a dog is a dog, what is the offspring of love? Richard and Michael go back to the discussion of love. Love is the most important law to human existence. It must come first if intelligence is to be maintained. Teaching true love is not religious. It is the most practical thing in the world. To love, you must first straighten out your definition of the word. This may sound trife, Richard, but the people who can feel love when attacked know what love is and what and do not have realities called anger and hate in them. But, Richard inter interjected, stay with me for a minute. Remember our goal is to let go of the old belief and manipulative teaching long enough to build some new brain cells. If when I am finished, what I have said does not make sense, throw it out and go back to your old way. Um, and Richard asks, how do I love someone who is abusive? Love 
love in Aramaic does not mean cooperate with with and help the people person who was beating up on you. It doesn't mean accept every person's atrocity where, with a smile and pretend that all is well when it is not. Love does not mean that you don't hold people accountable for their behaviour. Love is not passive state of suppressing your anger so you look like a saint. So it's okay to get angry when someone abuses you, Richard said gleefully. I thought so. The reality in your head is giving you information that was not delivered by my words, Richard. It's okay to get angry with someone if you want your mind to be stupid while you interact with them, replied Michael. So key thought, a mind without love is stupid. And I think we probably always, all, some of us, most of us, all of us, have had those moments of stupid. Yeah, haven't we, though? <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly resonate with that guy. <laughs> well, you know, it's really sad and crazy, insane, that that's become the norm in our world, that these beings that are literally, you know, if, if you hold a newborn child, you know, if you, how many have had the experience of holding a newborn and just go back to the moment where you held that newborn and tap into the essence of that newborn. And I mean, we've asked the, the question, we've had people go through that experience all over the world, tens of tens of thousands of people. And everybody's answer when they describe the newborn is some variation on the theme of love. And then if you ask yourself the question, so is the newborn loving me? No, the newborn is love. We live in global cultures that are specialized in knocking the experience of ourselves as love out of us. And then they give us a false definition of the word love. And they say, now go find somebody to love or go find somebody to love you. I remember that song back, was it back in the 60s? Don't you want somebody to love? Don't you need somebody to love? No, you don't. You need to experience yourself as who you are, as active, present love. And when you do, Everything shifts because now you've given your mind the fuel supply that it was designed for. Running a human mind on hostility and fear is like taking your, your finest race car that works on high octane, like, you know, 200 octane fuel and going down to the, the pump and putting in low test gas. It's going to knock, it's going to clank, it's going to quit it's going to wear out early and that's what happens to people who are not whose minds and bodies are not fueled by the active presence of love they clank they crack and they wear, wear out early they get horrible diseases and they die because what happens in the mind happens in physiology you know, we come back in history and can trace where the church and science got into an argument and they finally kind of saw it off and said, okay, you take the body, we'll take the mind. So science now tends to be locked into the mind as, or the, the, uh, the body as though if it isn't material, it doesn't exist. And yet, how do you separate the mind from the body? You know, let's imagine that I hand you a, uh, a silver dollar or whatever the coin would be, a pound of, 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 of the equivalent of a, of a one pound note in silver. And on one side of it is the head of the queen. And then the other side of it is what, I don't know, maybe the, the parliament buildings there. So we look at the coin and we say, well, see, there's the head of the coin and there's the tail. But is there a head or a tail on a coin? Or is the coin a singular experience and head and tail are perspectives? 
if I said to you, take the head off of the coin and leave just the tail. Can you do that? You can't do that. Because the coin is a singular thing. The head and the tail are a singular thing. The body and the mind are a singular thing. What happens in the mind happens in the body. What happens in the body happens in the mind. And you can't peel the head off of the body or the mind off of the body any more than you take the head off of the coin. Because they're a singular event and body and mind are just perspectives. Most disease is introduced into the body through the mind. It isn't bugs, viruses, and bacteria we need to worry about. It's thinking based in hostility and fear that introduces the conditions that produce disease in the body. When the disease is produced, the bug shows up to feed on it. The bacteria and the virus are just, or the bacteria at least, or infectious types of things are simply the going into the structure because there's a food supply there, something for them to eat. You know that old saying, if you feed them, it will come. <laughs> but if there's no food in there, they can't live there. It's the mind that introduces the disease process. The nervous system and the physiology reflect it. And so when we start to apply forgiveness and remove the states of mind based in hostility or fear, the states of body known as disease tend to disappear. And when we replace that hostility and fear with active present love, understanding who we are, our essential nature is love. Love is not something we do. It's not something we get. It's not something we give. It's what we are. Now, I've got some really bad news. And I've got some really good news. The bad news is nobody has ever loved you. And nobody's ever going to love you. And you have never loved anyone. And you never will. Because love is not a verb. It's not something we do. Love is a state of being. It's what we are. And when I remove... The hostility and fear, I will experience myself as conscious, active, present love. And I will function as that unless there's something resonated in my mind that's different than that. And if I get lost in that which is in my mind, which is also reflecting in my body and my nervous system, that's when I'm in trouble. And these tools are about changing that game and being restored to the truth of the essence of who we are. Does that fit and make sense for everybody? It certainly does. Go for it, young lady. So we tend to live exactly what we have learned. And if we have been used, been used and abused, it takes work to live differently. Relationships are wondrous places for nurturing, support and healing. If we can remove the confusing and conflicting realities we have looked into them, my experience of people who reject or cannot form long-term relationships is they have so much pain in their relationship file, they have to keep on the move or they will have to face what is hidden inside of them. In Aramaic, it appears that love is what we are. It is the stuff of human existence. Without it, we are not human but reduced to less than animal status. In Aramaic scriptures, we are told that we are made in the image and likeness of the creator, and that creator is love. Do you remember when you were a child looking around at the way the world worked and knowing in your heart it was supposed to be about something other than what you were seeing, something other than the 
almost universal strife. Look into the eyes of a child. How many times on an energy, energy level must that child be violated to cause him to hate? How much propaganda does it take to grow a child into a person who can kill, into a person who believes that the world is a fearsome place, that life is, that life is poverty, relationships, hell and sex dirty? What does it take for people to believe they are sinners condemned, condemned by the creator called love in whose image they are made? Why is there such confusion in the world? For the answer, check out who benefits from programmed consciousness. When building brain cells, the realities that show up in your mind from newly developed brain cells are fragile and e easily distorted by conflicting realities from the past. This is why I ask you to investigate, think on these ideas for yourself and not to believe a word I am saying. So I'm just gonna repeat that. This is why I ask you to investigate Think on these ideas for yourself and not believe a word I am saying. So the objective of this work is for you to have that direct experience, not put it in your head and believe it. There's nothing here to believe. Don't believe anything you've heard me say in any of these sessions or anything I will say. These words cannot give you the experience of yourself as love. These words will point to a tool and give you a pathway to the experience, but you're going to have to travel the pathway to the experience. And that's what we're here to support. What someone triggers, when someone triggers a healing opportunity, the first thing to do is choose to be responsible for your mind's output. Forgive and learn to hold the condition love in your mind in all circumstances, regardless of what your mind prompts you to do. We call that kind of love and com compassing love, the tool, my commitment from the Healing Through Relationships Workshop was developed to assist in creating that space for love. It is a powerful key to staying on track and keeping love in your mind when you feel in turmoil. It is the reminder to get back to a loving space when upset surfaces. Speak it daily in your closest relationships and say aloud to yourself while looking in the mirror. So this is my commitment. This is what to say in, to yourself every day. I'm gonna post it in the chat and in the WhatsApp groups as well. I promise to trust you enough to tell you the truth and treat you lovingly, gently and with respect. I will do this in my thoughts, words and actions, whether in your presence or not. In every interaction I will look for and knowledge the highest and best in you as I surrender to love, our true nature. My connection to my source and nurturing my relationship with you is always more important than any issue. If anything unlike love comes up, I will hold us in my heart and listen as I learn to speak, experience and be responsible for my own realities. I am here for and with you. I will keep communication open and keep love conscious, active and present as we heal and celebrate life. I'm not sure if you want to read that out, Michael, because maybe your voice as well with that one. No, I think that was awesome. And I just want to let everybody know that you can go to our website, whyagain.org. This commitment is designed for me to use with other people, but there's also one on the website 
for me to use with myself. So when I look in the mirror, it's done in the first person toward myself. So you can access that on the website. I've put this one in the chat as well. I've not got the other one on my screen, so you will have to go to Michael's website to get that one. So we're just going to take a moment to breathe because the best, best exercise I know to practice and strengthen your ability to hold space of love is to close your eyes and allow yourself to become quiet. With your awareness focused inside, think of that which inspires in you the clearest, strongest, most powerful love you are capable of feeling. So we're just going to hold the space for that and breathe. Perfect. We'll come to the final slide. Yeah. So this is, um, as you all know, he my voice. Book club runs non-profit events, and if anybody wants to express appreciation for this evening, you're welcome to that um, straight at Michael's um, site and to support him in continuing teaching these teachings, and um, because they are amazing. Um, and I found them really helpful and very life changing. So, if anybody does want to support Michael in that as well. And remember that the idea is you never forgive yourself, you never forgive anyone for anything. If you've done something off base and you need to pardon yourself, great. Or if someone else has done something off base and you choose to pardon them. But remember that if you call that forgiveness, <clears throat> then the tendency will be to leave the forgiveness work undone. Pardon them, if you will, pardon yourself, and then go in and do the forgiveness process for cleaning up your own minds. That's the objective. And the next chapters we're going to go through is Inherited Patterns, Chapter 20, Healing Crisis, and Chapter 21, Waking from the Has-Been. And I get the pleasure of knowing what's coming next, so I know it's going to be a really good session. <laughs> so I want to just say a huge thank you to Michael for um, coming and doing these sessions with us and bringing your wisdom and words for us to learn from. I'm gonna stop sharing the screen. if you want to have a final word before we close well uh, I guess we could take a minute and just see if all of that has fit and made sense and if anybody has any last minute questions again not questions about your personal process but questions about and uh, understanding what we've just presented anyone have any thoughts or questions If we have no hands, then I guess we're complete. Yes. There's quite a few thank yous in the message. Sweet. Awesome.
Well, thank you everybody for the opportunity to share this space with you and to make the tools available. I get as much out of teaching them as I do out of, uh, of just using them. So thank you all for the opportunity. And Yinka, thank you for the awesome work you're doing. Thank you for coming. <laughs> well fun. Absolutely honored and delighted. Mm -hmm. Well, have a wonderful evening, day, whatever time zone that you are in. I'm off to bed for 5 a.m. club tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, All right. Sleep well. Blessings, everybody. Bye, Good night. Everyone.